I encourage all of you to find all of the kangaroos that are here today. So thank you so much for having me, and it really is an absolute pleasure. I've never been to Austria, I've never been to Vienna, and I have seen just a small part of Austria, and it's absolutely beautiful, and I hope to come back. So thank you so much for everyone for inviting me here today. And the topic that we have today is more than 20 minutes, and so we're gonna do this in rapid fire. So sustainable packaging design, sustainable packaging, there is no silver bullet. There is no one single answer. Every single country, every single continent, every single region has to do it slightly different. But we do have to try and have consistent, harmonised standards. And so some of the things that I wanted to talk to you about that are really important for us on a global scale, doesn't matter whether you live in a small country or a developing country or a developed country, and one of them is the Global Plastic Pollution Treaty. And the core reason why I think this is a really important thing is because it will create consistent global harmonised standards for single-use plastic. It will eliminate plastic pollution, it will reduce single-use plastic, and it is really, really important that we have consistent standards. And when you look at a country like Australia, one of the challenges we have is we're a federation of states and we have different rules for every single state, just like the EU. And so we have no consistent standards on any of our regulations at all. And so that's really challenging for brands and producers and people that are designing packaging. And the Global Plastics Pollution Treaty, in my opinion, will change that. It will force the countries around the world that have signed the treaty to enact consistent regulations. And that's what we need to see to ensure that we can eliminate problematic materials, re reduce plastic that's floating in the ocean, make sure that it doesn't end up in landfill if we can put it back into packaging, etc., etc. And many of you know that. But one of the challenges that we have with is that there is no silver bullet because developing countries and developed look very different. And this is Indonesia. And this is what they're challenged with. They have no rubbish bins, they have no disposal, they have no waste management. Everything ends up in landfill or in open burning. And one of the challenges they have is they put cows, which they call waste cows, for example, into landfill to feed off the landfill. And then they kill the animals and then humans eat it. And so we don't have a balanced discussion. We are not on the same platform. And we need to make sure under the WPO that we can help support all countries and all regions around the world. And extended producer responsibility is your favorite topic at the moment in the EU. PPWI, you all know it, you all love it. But what's really important is, again, it brings consistent standards. And so whether you are working in the EU or in Latin America, or in Australia or any other part of the world, we are all watching what you're doing. We are all watching what the PPWR is, is enacting and hopefully we can learn from your challenges, your mistakes, um, your learnings, and we can bring it back into our own countries. And I wanted to share with you that EPR is not just Europe. EPR is everywhere. It's in different formats and I'm, I, I'm happy to share all these slides. But I just want to show you that there are many countries around the world that are enacting EPR. Eco-modulation, PRO programs, product stewardship programs, and we can go on and on and on. And that's fantastic. And then you get to a country like mine, and the problem we have is we don't have EPR. We have a voluntary commitment. And our voluntary commitment we've been working on for nearly 20 years and we are not going to meet our targets. And so our federal government said, enough's enough. You're not doing it as, as producers, you're not doing it properly, we are not going to meet these targets, we are going to mandate. And so we are now on the path to mandate national packaging design standards. We're going to mandate recycled content, we're going to eliminate problematic materials, we're going to look at chemicals of concern, and it's a very big challenge because just like the EU with PPWR, we have a federation of states. And every single state has to agree. And if they don't agree, we won't get EPR in our country. And just as a little bit of an idea, this is the consultation that's right, right now is being discussed and there's three options. Stay with the voluntary commitment, ban everything as option two, which we don't want, or create an EPR 
and the income modulation program. And another thing that's really important when we're talking about extended producer responsibility is container deposit schemes. And it's really pleasing for me to see that the EU is going to have consistent container deposit schemes in, in through the PPWR. I'm lucky, I come from a country that has it in every single state. They're not consistent, they're not the same machines, everyone has to do different things with the machines. However, the principle of collecting quality feedstock that you can put back into other packaging, put it back into materials and create other packaging works. And it really does. And you have some incredible success stories in Europe um, that have proven that if you put it in a retail store, it's far more successful than actually putting it outside of a retail store. Another area that I wanted to really touch on quickly is curbside collection. And curbside collection is about taking a problematic material like soft plastics and helping um, customers not have to return to store. Because not everybody returns their soft plastics to store. We're all, we're all guilty of it. We put it in our cars, we forget it, we don't put it in the store. Curbside collection is a fantastic solution. It encourages people to be able to drop their soft plastics and pouches into a bright colored bag and then it gets, goes off into the councils, it gets collected, it gets reprocessed. It could go into chemical and advanced recycling, it might be reprocessed into furniture or roads, depending on the, the, the country, but it is a fantastic solution. And so I wanted to show you a couple of examples of it. The UK, if you're not familiar with this, they have what's called M Flex Collect. And they have a bright purple bag and they've been trialling this for a couple of years. They have fantastic statistics and reports from the outcomes across the UK. Um, again, happy to share all of these slides with you. But a couple of the things that are really important is the bright coloured bag. And the bright coloured bag has two purposes. It helps you to identify the, the type of bag to put your soft plastics and flexibles in, but it also helps the councils and the, and the collectors and the reprocessors to be able to ship it off to the appropriate place that's going to go for recycling. And so with FlexCollect, what's happening at the moment is they're working all the way around the world, as you can see, and they're also supporting Australia and New Zealand. They're into Canada and the US. And they're trying to teach people how to create a really successful soft plastics curbside collection. And so this is ours in Australia, and it's been um, trialled for about 12 months, and we're starting to look at statistics. They changed the colour of our bag. They went from a bright, heavy bag to a, a red bag to a, a lighter orange bag. So the new trials are with the lighter orange bag. It was to do with the, the weight of the, the bag going through the materials recovery facilities and the sorting process. Um, but that is also a very successful program as well. And we also have another one on the left, which is called Kirby. Um, and it has an app as well, so that consumers can actually track and trace where their soft plastics goes. Another thing that's really important is chemical and advanced recycling, and I'm happy to, to, to show this to everyone later, um, but this is an example of um, a successful um, chemical and advanced recycling with mass balance. You can have a look at it um, and, and see what, what Nestle did in Australia. Um, and another thing that I wanted to talk about is on-pack labelling, because um, I noticed in the PPWR that you're looking at consistent on-pack labelling. That's because we want to make sure that all consumers around the world know how to dispose of their packaging properly. And the most frustrating thing, and I'm happy to share these, if you want to pass these around so you can have a look at some examples. Um, and all the logos are on the back, and there's also this one as well. Um, but the idea of um, the on-pack labelling programs is that if you have separable components, that you understand how to separate them and what in to put them in. And an on-pack labelling program simulates the actual true recycling ecosystem in your country. And so it, it, it's truthful, it's honest. And so whether your material can or cannot be recycled, you've got to tell people. You have to make sure that on your labelling, you're saying this is not recyclable or this is recyclable. But in, on top of that, you have to go a step further and you have to make sure that people understand which bin to put it in, which bin do I put my lid in, which bin do I put my sleeve in, which bin do I put my TPT bottle in. And so you will see that there are a number of programs around the world. OPRL, which is the United Kingdom, and I really encourage you to have a look at this if you're looking at developing something 
in the Europe. Um, and they have a really fantastic certification for recyclability as well. We have how to recycle in the United States, very similar to the one that we have in Australia. And as you can see, they're very intuitive, very easy for consumers to understand how to dispose of their packaging. And then we have the ARL for Australia and New Zealand, which is some of the examples that I'm showing you. And one of the insights of that is really important with consumer insight reporting with on-pack labelling is to see how successful it is. And so as an example, New Zealand is a really good country for recycling. They do a really good job. And they love the ARL. They love it. They want it. They want it on all packaging. And so what we're hoping in our region and what is going to happen in Europe is we have to mandate it. We have to mandate this, we have to regulate this, and make sure that it's consistent across the world. Another thing that's really important with on-pack labelling is that it's now evolving. And so it's taking all of the alternate pathways, the container deposit schemes, the coffee cups, the coffee lids, all of the blister packs, all of the things that can't go through a traditional materials recovery facility, and they're giving them a label, which is fantastic because it helps consumers to understand, okay, there's an alternate pathway, the logo explains it to me, and I know how to dispose of it correctly. We're also seeing apps. And the apps are really fantastic because consumers can now scan their packaging at home, and it will tell them whether they can put it in their curbside bin. It will tell them whether they should be putting in a container deposit scheme. And it will go so far as to say, your container deposit scheme is five kilometres away at this particular retailer, here's a map, and the shop opens at 10 o'clock in the morning. So it's a very intuitive applications as well. And I saw this, and if anyone is involved in this, please come and talk to me. And you have one in Austria. And the thing that I really like about this is that you have an incentive. You have vouchers, you have gifts, and you're incentivizing the consumers to come on the journey with us to recycle more appropriately. The other next step is QR codes, and there is a Caramello koala somewhere, in, and someone's probably going to eat some, um, but the Caramello koalas have a QR code. The reason they have a QR code is because at the moment soft plastics cannot be picked up through materials recovery in our country. And so the brand identified an easier way to, to communicate to consumers was through a QR code. And another one is from Brazil. And this is La Pina, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. And if you have any questions about La Pina, please go and talk to Luciana. And it's an integrated, collaborative, stakeholder success story, which is just a fantastic success story of how industry can work together. And it's similar to like our on pack labeling, but through to a QR code and to 2D code. Again, have a chat to Luciana about that. And then the one that I have to promise I only talk for a couple of minutes on, anyone that knows me, I can talk on this all day, is that one of the biggest challenges that we have in this industry, particularly in food and beverage, is that you're all talking about packaging waste. That's all you all talk about. All the cut consumers talk about. But we're not talking about that unintended consequence of food waste. And this is a problem. And it's a problem for all of you when you're designing your packaging because you're leaning towards the packaging waste when you're talking about your design centers and you're not designing your packaging to actually focus on a more important environmental impact, which is food waste. 800 million people around the world don't have food. And we have more than enough food that's in landfill all the way around the world, we can feed them. We have a problem. We don't design a, pro a packaging appropriately to make sure that we are saving that food, we're capturing that food. And so just a reminder, if food waste was a country, it would be the third largest greenhouse gas emitter in the world. But we only focus on packaging waste. And so it's a reminder when you are talking to people in the industry, when you are talking to your consumers, to remind them that the fundamental principle of design for packaging, contain, protect, preserve, transport. And we have to make sure that our packaging is fit for purpose and functional first. We're not saying it doesn't have to be sustainable, you have to focus on the fit for purpose and functional first. Because if you move to paper, 
without undertaking a life cycle assessment, you could potentially have an unintended consequence. And so we've got to make sure that we have life cycle, uh, life cycle assessment and we're doing it properly through science. And with safe food packaging, what we want to see is optimum pack design. And anyone here that designs packaging knows how hard this is at the moment. It's so challenging. And we have to make sure that we don't underpack and we also have to make sure we don't overpack. So we don't want to waste food, but we also don't want to waste material. And that's hard. That is really, really hard as a designer. And so I encourage you to get the balance right. And there are principles to get the balance right. And within sustainable packaging design, there are principles to get this right. And so you can use these 10 sustainable packaging design principles and when you're focused on food and beverage, you can actually look at designing to reduce product waste and accessibility. And what I mean by accessibility is if you cannot open it, if you cannot close it, if you cannot reseal it, and you can't grip it, you're going to waste food. How many people here have used a knife or scissors to open packaging? That is very poor packaging design and we need to redesign our packaging to make sure it's all accessible. And so there are five safe food packaging design guidelines. And this is a significant world first research project that's been undertaken through RMIT University in Victoria in Australia. And it's designed to follow science and evidence to help you to design better packaging for food and beverage so that we can, as an industry, have impact in minimising food loss and waste. And this is such an important area that I encourage you to take the QR code, have a look at the checklist, the resources, the training courses, which you can talk to the WPO about, and really try and redesign your packaging. And then just to close, as Luciana said, we have the World Star Global Packaging Design Awards and what's really important about this is we have, I think we have 19 categories now. We, we, we seem to have lots, lots more every year. But there is a really special one, packaging that saves food, and there's also sustainable packaging. If there are any brands or suppliers in this room that are designing packaging, please enter the safe food packaging category. We need to elevate that discussion around the world, and we need to start showing people best practice uh, examples. And so the WPO have worked really hard on developing case studies from the World Star winners. We have case studies now that are available to download for free for both sustainability and safe food, and we encourage you to have a look at them. We also have been working really hard with Safe Food Org, uh, Unido, FAO, and we are trying to create some additional programs. The Safe Food Org initiative is really important to all of us as partners because again, we're trying to elevate this discussion around the world. And we have a fantastic competition every year, which is to encourage developing countries to um, apply for a project and they win a 10,000 euro prize to be able to put towards their project. And this is an example of the, the winner from Egypt. And basically what they do is they take food that's plowed back into field, they teach the community how to cook nutritional meals for, for the community, for the village, and they take SIG packaging, which can extend the shelf life and preserve the, the food, and they use that as a part of the solution. We also have Safe Food or uh, Design Awards, and we have them now in China, the Middle East, and Africa. And we have some fantastic examples of the winners that are coming out of these countries. All of this is available either through the WPO website or Safe Food Org. And a really important position paper, which we will be talking about tomorrow, is a partnership between, and I hope I pronounce this correctly, like an Indian University, uh, WPO, and Unido. Alexa Love, so I think I didn't pronounce that properly. Um, and this is very much about this conversation. And we're including examples of our best practice examples from developing countries and developed countries. We're really excited we'll officially launch that tomorrow and we'll be able to share that as well. And then we have multiple working groups, position papers, resources, statistics. The WPO work very hard. We have a very large sustainable working group, which is fantastic. And um, we have some very passionate people around the world. The Global Packaging Design for Recycling Guide, I hope you all know. 
I hope you all know about this guy. Hands up if you do. Come on. Okay, we need more of you to know about this guy. So you need to talk to Manfred and Ernst about this. Um, but this is to help you to design recycle ready packaging. It's a fantastic guide. We've translated it into 14 languages so far. We will continue to translate this in as many languages as possible because it's really important that we make this available. We have 31 waste free mapping tools, so if you're exporting into multiple countries, you can assess whether it's the materials are recyclable or not. So when you're designing your packaging for that country, and we also have our fantastic sustainability special award and case studies. And at the end of the day, it's about rethinking the way you design your packaging. You don't have to design your packaging the way you've been doing it for 10 years. He wants you to redesign it. We want you to make it as sustainable as possible, with the lowest environmental impacts as possible. And it's really, really important that we can minimize any type of plastic if it's unnecessary, particularly single use. We want to make sure that we reduce chemicals of concern, which is very important for human health. And we need to make sure that we are incorporating recycled content and making sure that our packaging is circular by design. Because we, want, don't, we don't want to put new material on the market. We want to use the material that we already have. And what's really important to me is also keeping packaging out of the landfill. Packaging that has value, materials that have value, keeping it out of landfill and making sure that we keep it within our planetary boundaries. So thank you and hopefully you've learned something.